We're so excited to announce the launch of the Prism Bible app on January 1st, 2024. If you're looking for a new Bible learning experience, we'd love for you to download the beta of our new app. It's available for both iOS and Android and free for a limited time. Check out the Prism Bible app today. God's power and God's goodness have been demonstrated in creation so far, but today we'll see his breath breathed into his greatest creation yet on The Bible Brief. God saw that it was good. Everything created from the beginning to day five was simply good. But day six, day six will be God's crowning achievement in creation, so that by the end of the day, he sees that what is created is not just good, but very good. So let's pick up where we left off. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God's first move in day six is the creation of animal life for the land. Remember, simply by speaking, God had already created the sea creatures and the birds. But the final animal life that he creates will inhabit the ground. These creatures are identified as livestock like cattle, sheep, and goats, creeping things like reptiles and lizards, and beasts of the earth, which encompass all the other animals of the dry land. Think bears, lions, dogs, and everything else. So far, by God's amazing power, he's created something awe-inspiring. The sky and the clouds, the sun and the moon, the land and the seas, and he's filled them up with birds and beasts, fish and whales. And you know what God has been doing in all this? Preparing. Preparing for the creation of a being that will be truly special. A being with a blend of both physical and spiritual existence. A ruler with dominion over all the animals. The absolute pinnacle of creation. And God in his trinity says this. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And we get an even fuller picture of this creation in the next chapter of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2. If chapter 1 of Genesis is the macro creation story, chapter 2 zooms in and focuses on man in the micro story of man's creation. Listen to this from Genesis chapter 2. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, remember these two trees, because they're important to the story as it moves forward. These two trees will determine the course of humanity. But not yet. Before we get there, God is going to make sure that this first man would have a companion and a helper. God even goes so far as to call the current state of this man not good. The first time we see God calling something not good in the Bible. Listen to this. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, 
and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. God has given dominion over all the creatures to this man that he has made. And as a mark of that authority, the man names each of the animals as God brings them to him. But here, in this narrative, we also find that Adam is named. It's subtle, and that we just see his name mentioned as Adam, rather than the account of him being named. At some point, it appears that God named this man that he created Adam, and then he has Adam essentially name everything else. Now, despite this search for a helper for Adam, no other creatures were fit for him. Adam was different. He was in the image and likeness of God. And none of the other creatures were like that. And so God solves this problem that he calls not good with a very good solution. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Finally, a helper for Adam has been found, and he announces what she will be called as soon as he comes to from his surgical slumber. Since she was taken out of man, she will be called woman. Calling her woman here emphasizes the authoritative order that we've already discussed. It's a clear example of the authority that Adam had in creation. As God named Adam, Adam names the woman and names the animals. The structure of authority is set. God, then Adam, then the woman, then the animals. Now, authority does not necessarily confer the idea of value, but instead conveys order and structure. Adam wasn't more important than the woman. No, both the man and the woman were equally made in God's image and likeness. Rather, Adam was simply placed in authority over the woman, even though the man and the woman were of equivalent value and dignity. Okay, next in the text we see a small note, and this note is about flesh. We see that this two flesh from one, where the woman was taken out of the man, is reversed in marriage when man and woman come together again. It says this, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Adam's one flesh became two flesh with the creation of woman, where the woman was made from the flesh of Adam. And marriage recreates a union of one flesh again. This is perhaps most apparent in the production of children that naturally comes from a marriage. Those children are literally one flesh made from the flesh of their parents. The point here is this. God created marriage as a blessing and benefit to mankind, and he created it as the first and most foundational institution of human society. Okay, so we've zoomed in, and now we're going to zoom back out. We've looked at the creation of man and woman in Genesis chapter 2, and now we're going to go back to the days of creation to see how the rest of this creation week unfolds. After the creation of man and woman, we read this. And don't miss this. This is the creation command, or the creation mandate, given to the newly made humans. It says this. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God says this to the first human couple, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. 
exercise dominion over all the living creatures, and eat green plants and fruit for food. And after all this comes a happy judgment by God and a rest from His work. God saw everything that He made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Over the six days of creation, the utterly powerful God of everything creates the beautiful, natural world and everything in it. His creative genius and artistry is expressed, and he caps it all off with creating humans in his image and likeness. Until finally, he rests on the seventh day. He sets apart the seventh day as a day unlike any other, a day that we will come to know as the Sabbath. But that's for a later episode. For now, it will suffice to say that God set an example for humanity to follow in his creative endeavor. Work six days and rest on the seventh. So we've seen God's power in creation. We saw his preparation of the natural world for humans to have dominion over. But we haven't said much about purpose. What was the purpose of humanity? If dominion was the exercise of the purpose, what was the purpose itself? Well, the purpose is expressed right around the point where we saw those two trees that you shouldn't forget. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Those trees were in the midst of a specially prepared garden for the man and woman in an area called Eden. A garden commonly called the Garden of Eden. And it's in this garden that we find the purpose of mankind most clearly expressed. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Now this phrase, to work it and keep it, is an interesting one in the original Hebrew text. One Hebrew scholar suggests that it's best to render it not as work and keep, but worship and obey. The idea here being that mankind's purpose is wrapped up in relationship with God himself. Mankind was to be fruitful and exercise dominion over everything, but the context of those activities was to be in worship and in obedience to their Creator. In a way, God was saying, multiply and be benevolent rulers over everything while you walk with me in service and obedience. The purpose of mankind was to worship and obey God. To be these sort of priests who enjoyed fellowship with God as they ruled over the animals of the natural world. The humans were the pinnacle of creation, the capstone of what God had done. And as the commissioned leaders of the world, they were simply to worship and obey God in the garden that he had prepared. God's power has made all things. God's preparation has formed these things for man. God's purpose has been given to man. But in the midst of this power, preparation, And purpose is something else, a problem. After hearing God speaking all things into existence by the word of his power, we hear a new, smaller, sinister voice saying, Did God really say? The story is just getting started on The Bible Brief. The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2023